I am Lawrence Chuno, and this is Doing Jazz. Hello everyone and welcome to Doing Jazz. My name is Lawrence Chuno and this episode is with saxophonist and composer Jessica Jones. In addition to being a well-reviewed saxophonist, Jessica Jones is an artist whose impact can be felt in the music community in the forms of teaching and shaping of younger musicians. Jessica Jones is the leader of the Jessica Jones Quartet. Their latest album, Continuum, is a product of an earnest and organic execution of creativity. The music playing in the background is the title track of the album. During my conversation with Jessica, you'll hear the songs For the Cats of the Continent, Higher Than, and Continuum Reprise. Towards the end of our conversation, you'll hear the song Just This. These songs are all from the album Continuum. After listening to this episode, you can learn more about Jessica Jones by going to the website of the show, www.doingjazz.net. You can follow the show on Instagram and Twitter. The handle is at Doing Jazz. And you can listen to more episodes of Doing Jazz by subscribing on iTunes, Spotify, or any of the available podcast vendors. If you're on Spotify, please follow the Doing Jazz playlist, a one-stop playlist for songs by all the Doing Jazz guests so far. While on iTunes, please rate the show, leave a comment, and share the show with your loved ones. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I am very excited to present my conversation with the incredible Jessica Jones. Your face. Jessica Jones. Hi, Lawrence. Welcome to Doing Jazz. Thank you. Happy to be here. Good. Yeah. You finally made it. Yes. <laughs> the trains are very, they can be very, they can act weird sometimes in New York. So you just have to be ready for it and yeah. not freak out when that happens. Improvise. Yeah. yeah. All right. Before we go in, I was uh, looking, looking you up everywhere on the internet reading books about you, listening to your music, (laughs) researching you, and I found a lot of things. One of the things that piqued my interest was your your involvement in the the community, like your community teaching Mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, uh, Is there any of those things that you want to that you would like to talk about? Well, a few years ago, mm-hmm. my husband Tony and I started a nonprofit organization okay. called Rare Earth Vibration Association, or REVA, mm-hmm. and with the goal of creating access to arts experiences, creative art experiences for people who don't always get access, because it, it seems increasingly becoming a more rarefied thing that people can go to concerts or start an instrument and and so forth and so just the idea of bringing into the community the art making experience which is kind of what I grew up with Mm. and so we have uh, several programs that attempt to do that nice nice good so how do people get involved or how do people benefit from from Riva well some of the uh, programs we have one is a music mentoring program where I train some teenagers who are really excellent musicians Mm -hmm. to teach younger kids and so they get paid and get job training and the younger kids get lessons for free and that is one of the programs we have that's sort of helping kids get exposed to music and also providing an income for uh, 
the older musicians so they can continue to practice working on their craft and yeah. not have to give it up to, in order to go out and make money. Oh, that's, that's very, very important. Yeah. Another thing I saw, I'm just remembering now, is Jazz Girls Day. Right. Yeah, it's something I, I didn't know about. Right. Yeah. It's, it was something that was started in Berkeley, California, at Berkeley High School. And uh, I heard about it, and I thought it was a really good idea. And I was working for Jazz at Lincoln Center at the time. Okay. And I talked to them about having a Jazz Girls Day because mm-hmm. I was already working with a, a lot of kids with them. Yeah. And it's, ju- it's just a day of workshops and performances by women jazz musicians and high school girls and mm-hmm. so forth bringing in uh, girls to feel comfortable in an environment to try uh, improvising and being comfortable. And there tends to be, a, uh, a lot of girls tend to be involved more in elementary school, but then start kind of dropping out of the ranks. And mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's almost, it's hard to discern for a lot of people why that is happening. Yeah. And so I think there are a lot of attempts across a lot of places in the, both the U.S. and Europe that I've heard about trying to sort of um, address that and mm-hmm. making more comfortable environments for girls and more uh, more user-friendly for mm-hmm. girls and more community-oriented mm-hmm. things for girls. And this is one of those. And after this mm-hmm. one started, San Francisco Jazz started to do one, and we've Skyped with them on our day and had the girls communicate with each other. Mm. And um, I worked with some women in South Africa who have their own uh, jazz camp for girls and mm-hmm. they're ones pop popping up over the throughout the U.S. Mm. And so we're t- kind of trying to network because I think it can be very isolating to be a minority of any kind. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so a lot of the girls, they're one of one or two in their yeah. band mm-hmm. or they don't even know where to start yeah. understanding about jazz. So I think it's it's really important for them to understand other girls are there and to mm-hmm. be able to communicate and to have some role models. And it's really enriching for those of us who were one of one or two yeah. to also reach down and help. And that's, that's so excellent. It's really rewarding. Yeah. Uh, was this year the first year? No, it's a, it? I think the s- s- fifth or sixth okay. year. Oh, that's good. Of the New York one. Yeah. yeah I'm happy it's carrying on. It's carrying on. Yeah. That's really you. good. That's good. All right. Let's talk about another very important thing. Your album. Yeah. Continue. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that sort of comes out of Riva also because okay. we just started the label, the Riva Records label, as right. part of the Riva organization. Nice. And we're going to be reaching out to having other people who are not on major labors, labels and so forth be mm-hmm. able to distribute their music. But right now, okay. uh, yes, I re- released that album, mm-hmm. Continuum. And also, there's another album uh, with Charlie Burnham and. Tony Jones and Kenny Wallison on percussion and Marika Hughes on cello. Mm-hmm. Charlie Burnham plays violin and Tony plays saxophone. So that was one album that we released called Pitch, Rhythm, and Consciousness. Okay. And then the one that I released with my group is called Continuum, which mm-hmm. had my quartet that I've been working with for a while uh, and also some kind of guest artist and okay. different different combinations, but mostly okay. that quartet. All right. Okay. Wow. Uh, the, the one I, I paid close attention to was the Continuum one. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. so I'm more equipped to talk That's more fine. about that. And and we can talk more about... Yes, and I'm know. more equipped because I was on that one. I'm not okay. on the other one. All right, <laughs> so good. Go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, is there a theme to that album? Um, the, the theme I was thinking of with, uh, as far as the title <laughs> had to do with the fact that j- <laughs> jazz is something that's passed on kind of word of mouth mm-hmm. through from generation to generation. And that's the way I was thinking of that. Okay. And one, one of the songs, it, it has like an elder of mine on it. Um, Ed Reed, uh, who's yeah. a vocalist mm-hmm. who's 90 now, he turned 90 mm-hmm. and it's based on some, what's that song called again? Um, just, just as it is. Just as yes. it is, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's based on conversations that we have had together, and he oh. was sort of like imparting wisdom, mm-hmm. and I was taking some notes and yeah. kind of put it together into a song later, and then I was, I, I've been playing it instrumentally, and I thought, I was had a gig in California, and I was hoping that he could do it, and he said he was happy to do it, mm-hmm. and I realized... He lives have, in California. He lives in California, okay. and we recorded the album but in But he's New from York. Cleveland, right? From where? From is he from Ohio? No. It, it it I don't I don't know. I know okay. he spent a lot of those ninety years in the Bay Area. I don't oh, know if okay. he started in okay. the Bay Area. But he was able to overdub his part on there, so that was great. So he's the oldest one and then it went down to uh 
include uh, Ambrose Akin Musery, who was mm-hmm. a student of mine when he was like 14, 15. Um, and then a current... He lives in California. Right? Yeah, he okay. does live in California now. He was out here for a long time. Um, a student of mine who is, was 17 when we recorded, who I had just been teaching at my school, is also on the album. So I, I liked getting the kind of multi-generational yeah. uh, mix of it. But then one reviewer listened to it and said he was thinking of it as the... Be, because it's got a kind of eclectic mix of music Mm -hmm. as sort of a continuum of, you know, African-American music Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in general because it encompasses so many styles. And the album does have, you know, it's not super straight ahead the whole time. It sort of goes in a lot of directions, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is feels natural to me, but some people it's not, but some people, to me, it's all just one thing. To me, it's natural. To me, it's natural. And uh, you even had, like, an African element to mm-hmm. it, like the you, uh, well, the, the, the the instrument Ngoni, right. in one of the songs, the last song, Continuum, right. the reprise of the right. second right. version of Continuum. Yeah, it's f- the album to me. When I started list, I listened the first time, and then uh, when I was listening to the second to it the second time, the word that came to me was innovative. It, it, even though it might sound like it's a, it's an overused word, but to me, it's very appropriate innovative and then it's organic you know it's like yeah it's like that continuum because continuum is effortless and and organic Mm. so that's how i feel about the um about the music i appreciate that because Mm. i think that the idea of being really grounded Mm -hmm. can really help you see things in a new way instead of like trying to create something Mm -hmm. new it's Mm -hmm. sort of like to get really strong and understand what your own voice is like yeah. in in the fundamental way of doing things like yeah. i do it this way mm-hmm. what where am i going with this as opposed to let me make sure i do it differently yeah Does that make yes, sense? exactly yes 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 hmm. all right i want to talk about some of the songs yeah <laughs> yeah the first one that pop made me start listening to it more mm. is uh for the cats on the continent oh nice yeah uh so that song you know, it's kind of just an an easy blues. It was kind of a, a ve- it turned out to be a vehicle for the alto player Devante Dunbar, the, mm-hmm. who, who was the one I was talking about, the young young man yeah. um, who's now just started his first year of college. Uh, but it was written because my, Tony and I'm Tony Jones, my husband and I, were going to South Africa, as I said, for the uh, female jazz camp for female instrumentalists in okay. South Africa. They invited me to come and teach, which was an amazing experience. Mm-hmm. And Tony went with me, and we did some gigs with a community music school there, mm-hmm. um, run by Jesse Mohale and uh, Kafka. It's called. I, I'm trying to remember what it stands for. But mm-hmm. anyway, I wrote this song as one of the songs we could do with them. So mm-hmm. the continent I was talking about was Africa. Yeah. So for, for those cats, I wrote yeah. this song that I thought we could, you know, we'd be able mm-hmm. to all kind of meet on we played some of the, their music and mm-hmm. some of our music and it was a oh. it was a week of gigs and it was really fun our drummer was like yeah. 14 and mm. excellent and wow he has a name i can't pronounce because he has a click in it yeah amazing amazing nice um what did you like about that song Lawrence? what <laughs> the ending oh yeah the ending is like it threw me off like oh. i don't know uh, unless it's just how I felt about it, but I can't remember what happened. I was expecting it yeah. to end like on a one or a five, something like that. Yeah. But it just ended somewhere else. Okay? Yeah, yeah. I think that was Devante. He took a okay. kind of a cadenza. It was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Yeah. And then we ended on. Yeah. yeah. It ended. So Unexpected. Yeah, that's good. Then I started listening to it again. And I just like this song. That's good. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yes. Yeah. Then higher than. Um, yeah. Oh, higher than is from from listening. Do you know? I don't know if you know Larry Hamil- Hamilton. He's a, I guess, a R and B singer, and he his backup band, and he's excellent. And I was listening to a lot of him, and he has mm-hmm. a back. His backup singers are called the Hamiltones. Oh, okay. And okay. they they have is their it own. Anthony. Thing. 
Is it Anthony oh, Hamilton? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What did Ant- I say? Larry. I think you said Larry Hamilton. I think I grew up with a Larry yeah. Hamilton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Anthony is only my yeah. husband's name. I should be able to remember. Yeah. Anthony Hamilton. Yeah. Yes, and the Hamiltons. Thank you. Um, so the Hamiltons have some videos out, and in some of them, they're just improvising stuff where they mm-hmm. make up singing, and they're they're just beautiful and excellent. And I took yeah. a couple of the things that they okay. sang, and you know, added a bunch of harmonies and put some things together. But the mm-hmm. kind of the motifs are super inspired by mm-hmm. their, those mm-hmm. particular videos yeah. and um yeah and then i just kind of developed with the band some of the other aspects but it's wow. a very funky rhythm section too so yeah. they're, they're they're really huh.
musicians have always been influenced by pop for sure because that's you know what standards are that yeah. was the pop music and they yeah. that's kind of what everybody's working with I see. and i think you're always influenced by whatever you hear yeah. around you and, and I whatever you appreciate whatever right. you like yeah and i think tony and i both grew up in in a place where we were listening to a lots of different kinds of music okay. like heavy classical and salsa yeah. and jazz and free jazz and a lot of things all at the same time and it it wasn't really chopped into a lot of categories mm -hmm. and um so it was, it was all kind of free game okay. and i also think that i trust the musicians i play with yeah. to create those kinds of environments i mean it's not on me mm -hmm. they're funky like i said i yeah. didn't say i was funky i you know i make something and they add something to mm -hmm. it and it really makes it you know, I want something to play with mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I can trust them to build something that I can play with, which mm -hmm. I really like. Yeah. As I was telling you, what what I really liked about that song is also just one thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like that's the only thing I like, no, but that's the fun. thing that triggered my interest yes, in the song is that Tony's solo, how mm -hmm. he came in, you yeah. know, it's like he... He came in like somebody who is staggering in a very, very controlled way. You know, it's like <laughs> somebody's like, okay, you guys ready for me? I'm coming in and right. I'm going to shake things up, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Like a dancer who enters the room, exactly. like goes down the line. With and a lot of Whoa. swagger, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know what that was coming from. Well, that's good because I, I think some people don't appreciate unexpected mm -hmm. because it, it makes them uncomfortable. Yeah. So that's, it, it's what I like too. I like somebody to surprise me and keep me awake mm -hmm. and inspire me and make me think something, think in a new way. Mm -hmm. And like, that's really nice to hear because that's not what some people are looking for in their listening experience. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So that's good, good to hear that you're listening for that. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And the, the, the last one I want to talk about is Continuum. Mm -hmm. the, the, let's talk about the two Both. versions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so the first one I wrote, actually, I would, I think, I was think, I was sort of looking at the repertoire we had and thinking, I'd really like a sort of a Kenny Garrett-ish theme, mm. you know, that we can sort of be bebop-ish with and ch challenge me in in that kind of chord changes way mm -hmm. uh but i can push myself and grow you know you you write songs to, and they sort of make you do things you're not comfortable with almost mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it was kind of like that I, I and it the melodies came pretty naturally and so i made that song and then the the way the other version came mm -hmm. was that i was working at a um, music camp that i worked at at california for the last many 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 years mm -hmm. um and the housing is is very thin walls yeah. and I was housed next to this Ngoni player who was teaching that year for the first time yeah. and so he would practice in his room on his instrument uh, and I was listening to that scale that he was playing I was like that's a very familiar scale and I realized also the instrument sounds like um, the cor uh, the not the uh, the Duzenguni mm -hmm. which is what Don Cherry sometimes played yeah. and I was I realized that that scale was kind of like Don Cherry-ish and this whole sound to me. And I, and then I realized that the song that I had, the continuum had, was kind of the melody of the beginning was kind of that scale. So I sort of took that and went out and developed, you know, some sort of melodies, counter melodies, other kinds of things, and wanted to create something kind of loose and that sort of showcased the that that instrument. Nice. And. Um, yeah. Mamadou, uh, who who played with me, has you know stories and stories about it. He learned the traditional instrument and then created his own version of it, and you know cre makes the instruments and sells them in Berkeley as well as playing and composing his own music and performing. So that was a real treat to have a whole other sound on the album. It's like the same melody but coming from a whole other different place, and then to have Ambrose on it was just really heartwarming because I guess that's really the first time we've played together okay. since he became yeah. an adult <laughs> um, and it was very I was very honored that he w you know would come and be a guest yeah. and, play my and I'm sure he's very honored too to fight to be able to play on his teacher's you know <laughs> piece of work yeah he's yeah. A, I, yeah. I don't know if honored is the word but he's yeah. a warm person okay. and I, I feel like yeah. keeping that connection mm -hmm. yes I think I, I can think it's speak for him he's Nigerian so oh, I'll yeah, speak true. for him <laughs> even you though we don't, even though we don't know each other but yes. <laughs> I mean even though we don't hang out but yeah 
cool. Let me speak for him. Okay, I'll let you do that. Yeah. If he, if he complains, tell him to talk to me. I will. Yeah. I'll tell him he gave you the wrong message. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that was that was a, a and it also was a session that happened yeah. in California and it was mm-hmm. at a time that, you know, I was going through a lot of stuff with my family and it was just really nice to have music as a solace kind of and that mm-hmm. song I just feel like that was reflected in that song too. It was kind of listening to Doing Jazz with Lawrence Chuno. The guest on this episode is saxophonist, composer, and educator Jessica Jones. Her new album, Continuum, is available for purchase, download. All right, let's switch gears a little bit. Sure. Let's learn more about you. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> where are you from? Berkeley, California. Berkeley, California. Yeah, that's okay. where I grew up. Yeah. Hmm. Did you grow up in a musical family? No. Uh, not my f- family directly. I mean, you know, my brother has really good pitch singing, mm-hmm. but and I had piano lessons, but okay. I didn't. It isn't something really in our house mm-hmm. any more than books and science and other things like that. Hmm. But the school system was very supportive, and the the public library was yeah. really strong with music and things like that. And it's a cultural center, and it's kind of a valued thing in the community. So I think. Mm-hmm. I grew up around music because of all of that. Yeah. And a lot of us started really young I, in that in that area. Um actually you and you talked to Norbert Stat- Statchel at yeah, one yeah, point. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He's from that area yes, too. Yeah, um yeah. and I th- you know they start they started this experimental jazz program mm-hmm. for kids like age 9, 10, 11 mm-hmm. uh, when I was 9, 10, 11. Mm-hmm. But I didn't, I didn't get into it till I was 13 and I was really late and I felt super far behind, hmm. <laughs> which is weird. And yeah. I, I got it together later, yeah. but I'm just saying it, it was really young. And yeah. up until then, I don't think there was any jazz education before college. People always just assumed you learned your instrument and then you could start learning theory and everything. But this was mm-hmm. a, a really innovative program that just had kids, they'd say, okay, these are your five notes, uh, mess around, make a solo. Mm. Here's a cool beat. Let's, uh, you know, and and arranged music for the range of the that the kids could play and yeah. so forth. And that was Phil Hardiman who started that program. So a lot of musicians have come out of that. Okay. The result of that program, mm-hmm. um, uh, Joshua Redman and mm. Peter Applebaum and uh, I don't know all the Berkeley people that came out. Yeah. Um, so they had all by the time they got to high school, <clears throat> they'd all been playing improvising for like five or six years already wow. you know so yeah. it, it it's like anything else if you start a language young, yes, you'll yeah. be able to speak it well so exactly so i was around a lot i was influenced by a lot of that everybody mm-hmm. was listening to to jazz and you know getting together and 
hey, you should check out this recording mm-hmm. and hanging out. What we did in high school for fun was we hung out at record stores and yeah. looked at all the records. And nice. So you, you started out just playing jazz. I, I started out on classical, on classical, on classical okay. piano. Mm-hmm. I really wanted to play jazz piano, mm-hmm. but I couldn't figure out how to find out how to do that. Yeah. So, um, I, and I liked classical piano a lot and played it. And then in eighth grade, I finally figured out that I heard saxophone every time I heard jazz. Yeah. So if nobody could teach me how to play jazz piano, maybe if I took up saxophone, it would come out jazz. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, you know, and then I started listening more and I, yeah, started getting more into it and yeah. wound up being able to dabble in the jazz piano too. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. And then you, in college, you, did you study music in college? I did. F- uh, I went to UC Berkeley for a year as a music major. Yeah. And I, I kind of rebelled at the end of the year yeah. against myself mm-hmm. and said, it, it made me hear music in a different way and, yeah. it, and it kind of, that bothered me. Mm-hmm. And so I wound up switching to um, UC Santa Cruz, which is anyway... I don't know if you know Santa Cruz. It's by the ocean. It's yeah. beautiful. There were no grades, and there was a good martial arts teacher. Mm. And so I said, okay, that sounds good to me. I didn't even How, visit. Wait, no grades? They had narratives. Like okay. they, they, w- they would give you evaluations, oh, okay. which it turned out were way more specific and yeah. helpful. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, yeah. how did it, this person? Was it a cons- conservatory? No, no oh, this, okay. this was just like, I'm not going to do music. I'm going to go be by the beach, Okay. you know, and in a pretty place hmm. and... It just stop all these numbers yeah. in my head that are associated with music. But once I did that, I start, realized, and I kind of took whatever classes I wanted, I, yeah. I realized that I certainly missed it, yeah. missed fi- you know, finding people to play with and so mm-hmm. forth. And I found a, a community college that was like a an hour bus ride away, and I yeah. started going there and playing saxophone there and playing piano there. Mm-hmm. And so I sort of healed up some things and learned, you know, learned a lot. I started started to take a lot of like dramatic arts and um, linguistics. I was really into linguistics, but at the same time I had some music situation where uh, I was able to play piano in a combo and lead alto in a big band. And Mm -hmm. I hadn't had those opportunities that much at the high school because the level was so, so high that I always thought I wasn't, you know, in comparison, very good. So it was nice to be in a situation where I found out I had something that was valuable to, Mm -hmm. you know, help, help an ensemble Mm -hmm. so that was a valuable experience and then I tried to put that all together I looked back at all the classes I had taken and decided I wanted to major in the sound of language as music Mm -hmm. Um, and but I wanted to be back in the Bay Area where I could find more musicians and play with people and and then I realized I, I had I met with an advisor to talk to him about how I could stay in school and do this major. And he, he was like, what do you really want to do? It sounds like you're trying to find a way to stay in school, mm-hmm. which I was. Mm-hmm. And I said, I, I want to play the saxophone in New York, you know. And it, I didn't even know that that's what I wanted to do mm-hmm. until that's what until I talked to him. Hmm. And then it came out of my mouth. I don't know if you've ever had that. Like yeah, yeah. you sort of see yourself say something yes, you're yeah. out of your body yeah. <laughs> and you're telling yourself something. So mm-hmm. then I, you know, saved up some money for the rest of that year. And then I moved to New York and tried to play the saxophone. It was wow. harsh and good for me. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then I've been kind of in and out since then. I've been okay. had two stints in New York with a stint in California in between. Okay. How, 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 how long was the stint, the in between stint in California? Oh, uh, I think probably about seven years. I seem to have these seven-year cycles. Okay, okay. I, maybe that's a Saturn thing, no? That's 23 <laughs> yeah. years or something. Um, yeah. yeah, but th- that made sense because yeah. we were starting a family and, mm-hmm. you know, okay. we had our, our son out there. And Okay, nice, nice. All right. How important is teaching to you? It seems like it's something you, you've done quite a lot. and Yeah. I, I Well, when I was in high school, there was a program similar to the one that I'm running now yeah, where sorry, sorry, where we um, we did some teaching as teenagers to younger kids okay. and made money and could buy records. And mm-hmm. I, I was like, whoa, you know, this is something I could do. Mm-hmm. You know, I could understand how to do this. It wasn't like I... Th- being a musician which is kind of a nebulous thing like you're not really sure what that job is Mm -hmm. because you know it's not the same job all the time but teaching Mm -hmm. I could understand and I could do and it's kind of like breathing you know because I like communicating and I like kids and stuff and kids are interesting and have good imagination so they're fun to be around yeah so it's I it developed that I did it for a long time Mm -hmm. and 
it's been good. I think I have to be careful sometimes in that as a woman, it's really common to be helping other people yeah. and to be rewarded for helping other people. Mm-hmm. So it's a very helping profe- profession and you focus on other people's development. Yeah. And I have to be careful sometimes to balance that with mm-hmm. focusing on my own development. Mm-hmm. So that's, um, that's something I have to watch. And I think, you know, people appreciate you teaching and there aren't that many people who want to give of themselves in that particular yeah. way. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it's been a really wonderful thing for me. Mm-hmm. And I think a wonderful way to connect with people and to heal myself. Yeah. I think that's one of the things about teaching is you, you see yourself in other people mm-hmm. and you can help yourself by helping them. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's also, from what I see of some other musicians who, for the past 30 years, have not had those kinds of connections with people, yeah. it's um, it's a really, like you were saying, organic, it's a really organic and important and life-filled way to meet with somebody. Mm-hmm. And sometimes being a musician on the road yeah. does not feel like that, and people yeah. don't get to build those kinds of relationships over time. Mm-hmm. So I really appreciate that about it it's it always feels meaningful Mm -hmm. it always feels meaningful and Mm -hmm. music is meaningful and performing is meaningful but i think that sometimes as a performer people don't get to feel that reward because Mm -hmm. they kind of play and leave and then people listen to recordings and they're being they feel rewarded but they don't get to have the relationship with the person yeah Mm -hmm. so i appreciate what that's brought to my life Yeah. yeah that's good wow nicely said Um, I have this question about instruments. Um, It seems like every musician plays, understands the piano, right? Mm. Every working musician or every studied musician should understand the piano. Do you think it's important for every musician to understand a horn instrument? Oh, that's an interesting way to look (laughs) at that. Uh, I mean, absolutely yes and absolutely not. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, uh, probably if there was, uh, there are cultures without piano and they're fine and their music is beautiful. So Mm -hmm. it's, that's not necessarily a given. It's a, it's a certain way of understanding that I'm, I appreciate that I had, but like, I mean, every Western musician understands (laughs) piano. That's what I'm, I I I I understand. I know what you meant, but (laughs) it's interesting because there are things you can get to like you you can see a whole chord at once in a way as a pianist that it's harder for people who don't have that background on piano Mm -hmm. or you, and you perceive, you can perceive it visually in a way that maybe a guitarist couldn't even do it. So I I think it's been really useful for me for the way that they do jazz education, but it's not necessarily what it wasn't really the best thing for me because I didn't learn by ear on piano the way that I connect when I do on saxophone I see. because it can be like typing if mm-hmm. you're not mm-hmm. connecting in that way mm-hmm. you, you can do play it visually which you can't really do with saxophone you have to and certainly not with a brass instrument mm-hmm. so I'm getting I'm circling back around to, to your question yeah. I think I feel like whatever you can get your hands on and learn a little bit about yeah. gives you a better understanding certainly as a composer of what people are dealing with because mm-hmm. on if you're writing jazz you should also understand what a bass feels like Mm. you know because they're underneath and they're holding everything up and getting no recognition and Mm -hmm. and yet controlling it and Mm -hmm. you know it has a whole role and you know brass players all all of it has it's good to understand other Mm. perspectives and i think it brings something to your music um and it's interesting teaching because there are kids who at 15 are trying, you know, I want to see what a trombone, I want to see, and I'm kind of like, okay, I see that's a composer, mm. you know, as where it's, as it's far, and then there'll be somebody else who's just, this is my instrument, I'm, mm. I'm a flute player no matter what, mm. you can try to get me on these, but this is my instrument. Mm. Um, and it makes different perceptions, I think, and I don't think one is more valid. Yeah. And a composer can be coming out of a melodic instrument and create really interesting counterpoint hmm. And not just be like, I'm going to play a C7, so you have to play an E. Yeah. You know, the, so I think to, Tony doesn't have a doesn't come from a piano background. Tony, my husband, mm-hmm. and when he composes, it's the lines are really individually interesting and rhythmically, uh, you know, things that I could never think of. Mm. And I think part of it comes. So it can be, it can be 
just a filter. It's just, yeah. I guess it's like a filter of a way that you hear or approach something, and it's yeah. good to get out of your comfort zone. Nice, nice. Hmm. What I'm do you learning play? so much. <laughs> What do you you play? I, also, I play right? piano. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. My next question is: mm -hmm. How old is too old to oh. begin learning the? Let's hope the, the 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 horn. The horn, yeah, like a saxophone. Oh, let's hope there is no, no. age limit on okay. it. <laughs> And I I think saxophone is also physically much easier to um, begin and get satisfaction from than a brass instrument because i think there are more muscles going on with a brass instrument okay. um and you know i don't know if you've seen the i love lucy episodes where she plays saxophone I haven't but seen, yeah. you know you can play a few notes and be really happy yeah, so i see it. so it's never too late to be <laughs> happy too, okay <laughs> okay good but you should start for sure i think so i think so <laughs> I have an auto sax and I haven't. Oh, good. I've never touched it. Oh, uh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah What I are know. you waiting? You think you're waiting for permission? I, I, I just feel like maybe I should just keep working on my piano because I'm not the best pianist yeah. and I want to get better on the piano. So I'm oh. like, should I be spending time trying to learn another instrument meanwhile you shouldn't deny yourself i think whatever yeah. whatever you're being called to do you should mm -hmm, do sure. and but if you feel yourself like i'm not uh, a good enough person yet yeah. to play that mm -hmm. i haven't earned that yeah. then maybe that's worth Ma questioning you true know? true but <laughs> we we never i mean i never spend enough time on my instrument it, it, that that's your whole life that's mm -hmm. going to be it's i think it's just always going to feel that way finally it took me a long time to realize that it's kind of not like It's never that you get closer mm -hmm. to where you want to be, yeah. but it gets clearer. Yeah, I see. So it's I like you, ne you yeah. you're never almost there. Yeah, yeah. And it gets clearer. It's like you begin to know the things you know and the things you don't know, and then begin to devise a better way to get to the things you don't know. Right, yeah. right. And also I think you just have more to work with on your travels or whatever, yeah, you know? Yeah. Do you still practice any other instrument like the piano for instance yeah okay okay yeah i i, I practice some piano i mean i'll go in phases but when yeah. i'm in a a block of i'm going to be practicing a lot then mm -hmm. i try to practice some piano so okay. that i'll uh you know expand my sense of voicings and yeah okay. have some new pathways you yeah. know for the notes to go because mm -hmm. they tend to go into old habits mm -hmm. and i don't want them to keep playing the same phrases mm -hmm. nice All right, we're going going to end with a game. This game I call it Turn Up Mute. All right. <laughs> turn up mute. Oh, okay. So I'll give you okay. two options. You turn oh, one okay. up, you mute the other. Okay. All right. But I'm going to give you an out. The the caveat is that whichever one you turn up or whichever one you mute, it doesn't mean you don't like that one. Right. Okay. It just means for now you prefer the other one. Okay. All right. That sounds friendly. Okay, yes. <laughs> But it's a tough game, so be careful. Okay. <laughs> All right. The first one, Sonny Rollins, Wayne Shorter. You're making things impossible, yeah. but Sonny Rollins is uh, my total life goal. So hmm. I would turn up, turn Sonny, up Rollins Sonny Rollins. Okay. And momentarily yeah. <clears throat> mute Wayne Shorter, Wayne Shorter who is okay. very close to my heart. Okay, yeah. When you get 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 back on the train, you listen to Wayne Shorter. <laughs> yes, exactly. To make up for <laughs> yeah, what I just said. <laughs> And if you ask me tomorrow, it might be the opposite. It might be the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if um, is another sax player, Mike Lee. I don't know if you know Mike Lee. No. Oh, okay. He was just here, and I asked mm. him the same question, and he said Sonny Rollins. Too. Are you surprised? I'm surprised. I don't know. Maybe it's because I haven't. I think I should go and listen to mm. Sonny Rollins more because I've been listening. I'm in love with Wayne Shorter. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I am in love. I wanted to be Wayne Shorter, <laughs> uh, you yeah. know. And there's Wayne Shorter with the Jazz Messengers. I like. Yeah. I like tried to drink that into my body. Yeah. You know what I mean? But Sonny Rollins has a has this. I mean, I don't. I'm not. I don't try not to ascribe to the word talent mm -hmm. because I, I teach and mm -hmm. I think everybody's got talent. Everybody's yeah. got strengths and weaknesses and blah blah. blah but, but he can be absolutely in it in a bebop way mm -hmm. and has no problem taking it completely mm. loose and and can find his way back. Yeah. And he hears it all at the same time. Yeah. And it he doesn't differentiate between. He just like goes places like you like what you hear in Charlie Parker. There's like. People play like Charlie Parker, but then there's this above, beyond thing 
that we don't describe mm-hmm. and don't write down, mm. you know what I mean, that is there. And I feel that with Sonny Rollins, just that, like there's a an explosion of creativity that happens when he plays sometimes. Mm. And and I really admire his work ethic, yeah. you know. Okay. And Wayne Shorter has that too, the yeah. work ethic too. And mm-hmm. I, th- I can't compare them, but yeah. your but question wasn't comparing them. Yeah, it was just, just which one do I want to hear right one now? now. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> San Francisco, Oakland. Oh, that's super interesting. <laughs> you know, I'm not there enough to uh, to understand those cities right now because yeah. they've both changed a lot. Okay. But I certainly have hung out more in Oakland. Okay. And uh, I have a lot of heart for Oakland, you know, and it's Oakland and Berkeley are like close sisters. Mm-hmm. And Oakland is sort of more Berkeley than Berkeley is right now or mm. something. Um so I it, it would be Oakland because you know, okay. San Francisco can take care of itself. Yeah. I guess that's what yeah. I feel like. Yeah. It's, it's got its tourists and everything, but Oakland is, is it's, it's it's Oakland's moment right now, and, okay. and I I, I appreciate. How about that. Oakland, Berkeley? Uh, Still Oakland? <laughs> uh, uh, no, I I don't think I have an answer for that. Okay, I, I, that's, that's let me think good. about that. <laughs> You know, one is from more familiar, and the yeah. other is really happening right now. Okay, okay, okay. That's good. I enough. guess you can tell which one is which. So yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> All right, the last one. I want to talk about you. And just this, two songs. Oh on the yeah, album. but one's by my husband, so that's not fair. <laughs> Ah, okay. Um, well, see. I was going by the feel. Okay. You yeah, know? Oh, so the recorded. The, yeah, they're recorded. Recorded, they are both recorded. More, they are both like um, f- kind of free. Yeah, they both have a looseness yeah, to them for yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, they both have a. Uh, um, uh, gee, <laughs> let's let's turn up just this because okay. I think it has a looseness in in two saxophones together and yeah. I kind of like that sound okay. and the other one has only one saxophone mm-hmm. it has saxophone and bass mm. but for today nice. we'll do the we'll yeah. Yeah. turn up the uh, mm-hmm. saxophone loose and tomorrow it'll be mm-hmm. the other one mm. you could do it you could do this as today and tomorrow uh, instead yeah, of yeah <laughs> today and tomorrow okay yeah <laughs> maybe maybe I should think about that no, yeah. I like I like this this is good alright Jessica Jones thank you so much thank this you this has been fun thank you for yeah. me too I hope we can do this again because yeah. it seems like you you have a, a good frequency of releasing albums. So whenever the next one comes out, yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Totally. I'm, Thank you. I'll be available. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. We did it. <laughs> Bye.